Hello, and welcome to the Cornell Fine Arts Museum, um, at least in spirit. Um, I'm Anna Heller, and I'm so happy to be hosting this first event of 2021. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Victor Kunin, who is a professor of art history at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. He's been there since 1995. And he is a very widely published scholar of Italian Renaissance art. Uh, his most recent book on Donatello and the Dawn of Renaissance Art just came out in 2019. He's also the author of a monograph on Michelangelo's David, fascinating book, I recommend it very highly, called From Marble to Flesh, The Biography of Michelangelo's David, as well as the editor of several other books, uh, author of dozens of articles, um, and encyclopedia essays, catalog entries for leading uh, European and American venues. It is really a pleasure to welcome you, Victor. I had hoped to welcome you in person. Um, Victor and I used to hang out in Florence together when we researched our dissertations. So I was hoping we can replicate that in Winter Park, but that's not happening. His lecture tonight is in conjunction with the exhibition Drawing Connections Inside the Minds of Italian Masters, a selection from the John Micah collection, which we had hoped to uh, invite you to, and but we hope we will invite you to see as early as next week. And uh, the lecture is generally supported as are most of our public lectures by the Thomas P. Johnson Distinguished Scholars Funds of Rollins and the Gary Libby Foundation. Um, uh, Dr. Kunin's uh, lecture tonight is entitled Renaissance Art Exposed, Leonardo da Vinci and the Secrets of Drawing. And I, before I give him the podium, um, I want to mention that should you have questions, comments, please put them in the chat or in the comments box. And uh, we will have some time at the end of the lecture to um, discuss with you all. So, Victor, it's all yours. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I um, uh, promised uh, uh, Professor Heller that if she would keep the introduction short, I would uh, keep my thank you short as well so that we can dive right into the uh, lecture. Uh, but I do want to thank Professor Heller and also Professor Kim Dennis for inviting me to, to Rollins, um, whether in person or, or virtual. It's, it's an honor to be here with you, and, and I hope to uh, share uh, some 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 thoughts that that you find um, provocative and and interesting. I also want to thank uh, John Micah for uh, allowing this collection to be shown at Rollins. I truly wish that I could be there in person to investigate them. Um, so let me show you um, why. Um, my main goal here today, uh, really above above anything else, is to um, make you feel this 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 compulsion, this necessity to go and and look at art, uh, especially to look at drawings. These these wonderful drawings that are in the show. I've seen a, a sampling of some of the uh, drawings, and I'm really jealous that I that I can't go there and, and stick my nose up to the glass and and really uh, look hard at these drawings. But but you all have this opportunity, and you should take full advantage of it. I'm starting off with this kind of a uh, humorous slide to remind me of uh, a time when I was in graduate school and a mentor uh, said to me as we were discussing some, some drawings, you know, with, with drawings especially, he said, sometimes you have to be the detective and look at all of the evidence that, that makes up this, this crime, this wonderful crime that, that is the art. And at other times you have to be the judge and figure out why these lines are there, what the drawing means, why it was what was made, and come to some reasonable conclusions. So what I hope to do today then is to give you some food for thought, to uh, give you some, uh, some base knowledge about how to look at some of these drawings. And then I hope that you'll be able to go to the show and, and make some judgment calls uh, of your own. So um, drawing. You have a couple of images here of um, drawing studios, of, of probably painter studios um, back in the, the 16th century. And it's interesting because you see loads of pupils as well as masters. And 
almost all of them are busy drawing. They're drawing from uh, models, they're drawing from plaster cast, they're drawing from other uh, works of works of art. And the question is, why why draw? Why is there such a, a large emphasis on drawing? Well, in Italian, and especially in the in the Renaissance, the, the term for drawing, disegno, had a dual meaning, uh, both the actual act of drawing, as well as design, this, this larger sense. And it could mean both things at the same time. In other words, to, to design something was to effectively draw it out in your mind and maybe on other surfaces as well. We have many quotes, I've just pulled a, a, a few uh, for you that reinforce this. Um, one of my favorites uh, here from a, an author in the 16th century who says, Donatello judged drawing so essential that he used to tell his students that the entirety of art could be taught to them in a single word, draw. Michelangelo uh, wrote on the drawing sheet that you see on the right, draw Antonio, draw Antonio, draw and don't waste time. Uh, it's a remarkable thing uh, to have this great master uh, writing that to one of his students. We have Giorgio Vasari, who you probably encountered as the great um, chronicler of the lives of Renaissance artists, who says, disegno, meaning drawing and design, cannot have a good origin if it does not come from continual practice and copying, and get this, natural objects and from the study of pictures by excellent masters and of ancient statues in relief, the best thing is to draw men and women from the nude. So in other words, you have to draw everything. You have to draw living things. You have to draw um, uh, uh, copies of what other great masters have drawn. Um, again, it's draw, draw, draw. And finally, one of my favorite all time quotes, as Michelangelo uh, was supposed to have been very late in, in life, sitting at the Colosseum making a drawing, and a companion came up to him and said, Michelangelo, what are you doing? And his response was, I'm still learning. That's a wonderful uh, remark from an artist who, at this time, you would have thought had, had done most of his, his learning, but, but no, he was still drawing, still using that to learn, and Picasso, is imitating Michelangelo when at the age of 80 writes on a drawing, I'm still learning as well. So, so drawing was a way to learn. And here you have Michelangelo learning. It's one of his earliest drawings and he's copying the great Italian master Masaccio there on the right. You have Leonardo da Vinci who is learning here as he's studying the nude model, in this case, a male figure. And you can see obviously from the front, and from the back. So they're really practicing what they uh, preached. And going from the theoretical to the practical, as you can see, almost all works of Renaissance art began with drawings. You have three examples by Leonardo da Vinci, but on the left, he's making some studies for architecture in the middle for a sculpture and in the right for painting. And here you have four of the greatest masterpieces of Italian Renaissance art. You'll recognize on the left, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling, two works by Leonardo da Vinci, The Last Supper and The Mona Lisa, and on the bottom right, uh, Raphael's famous School of Athens. All of these began with drawings. Now, sometimes we know what these drawings look like, sometimes we don't, but let me show you some pieces of evidence here. In this case, what we have is a drawing uh, by Leonardo da Vinci on the upper right, where he is working out the uh, names and appearances of each of the apostles that he has at the Last Supper. So in some senses, a relatively straightforward preparatory study. And on the bottom, you have a drawing by Michelangelo as he's trying to work out one of the figures from the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So again, we have direct evidence of these artists uh, putting pen to paper, quite literally, and working out what it is that they're going to then paint. But we also have hidden drawings, or at least hidden evidence of, of, of drawings. And um, if we look at the uh, history of the techniques of, of Italian wall paintings, this is a nice prep for when we're going to be looking at drawings on, on paper. 
I'm going to abbreviate this just to its essentials. And the drawing on the left is, is not done to scale. But what I want you to see is on the far left, you have a stone wall. And then it's been plastered over in what they're labeling as the aricho. And then there's a line, which I have marked with the red arrow. And on the other side of that line is the intonico, which is the fresh plaster that they're eventually going to paint on. And that paint layer should really just be another line. And in between the aricho, which let's assume for our purposes is, is dry and the intonico, which is going on wet, there is actually a drawing that they are following, which gets destroyed in the process because it gets covered up. But modern conservators and actually uh, older conservators too in, in previous centuries were able to separate that intonico layer from the aricho layer to reveal the underdrawings. These are remarkable things that the artist never thought would be seen again. Uh, and here we have a glimpse of them. They're generally called Sinopia drawings, which comes from the name of the ink that they used, which in turn comes from a city in modern day Turkey, Sinop. And you see this, this reddish, reddish brown uh, sort of coloring that would have been their guide. So they would have plastered over the section that they were going to paint that day and then paint on the wet plaster. Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, when we advance a little bit and you have the widespread use of paper, you would still often use the Sinopia drawing, but you could also cheat a little bit. You could have a drawing ready to go that was a full-scale preparatory drawing. This is what we mean by the term cartoon. And with the cartoon, what you would do is put that over the wet plaster and either trace very carefully along the lines as you see on the left, the lower left, or you could use this method called pouncing or spolvero, where you would prick beforehand little holes all along the outlines of what it is that you drew. And then you would take charcoal dust and you would pounce uh, on one side of the drawing, the charcoal dust would go through those little holes. And when you peeled back that um, uh, paper, uh, you'd be left with a nice outline to follow for your final painting. Here you have a really nice example of the uh, painter, sculptor, this great artist, uh, Verrocchio, who uh, made the drawing that you see in full scale on the, on the right, and a detail on the left that shows you the pinpricks that are still in that drawing that he would have used in order to pounce on the other side, and then leave an impression on either the canvas that he was working on or, or the panel or the, or the fresco if he's painting on a, on a wall. So all of this is leading up to, to the um, uh, sort of takeaway reveals, if you will, right? Here we have an example uh, from the Sistine ceiling seen in, in very much uh, close up. But clearly what Michelangelo did was use a cartoon. He pricked the cartoon. And then if I can get my cursor working, you can see these little dots that are working through the figure. And Michelangelo then we know was using drawings, these full scale preparatory drawings. We know that he was using the pouncing method and that he was using drawing in order to guide his hand as he was painting one of his greatest masterpieces. Interestingly enough, it's only recently, effectively since, since last year, that we know absolutely that Leonardo da Vinci also used this technique in painting the Mona Lisa. This detail here comes from where the hands are overlapping one another. And you can see here in this um, uh, photograph uh, using uh, infrared uh, reflectography, where uh, when that is magnified, you can see very, very tiny pinpricks were used. And uh, there's little bits of that charcoal that is left underneath the painting that you can't see with the naked eye. Uh, but with the help of modern equipment, we can look through those upper paint levels uh, of the Mona Lisa and see absolutely positively 
Leonardo da Vinci had a drawing of Mona Lisa's hands and he used that drawing in order to make a guide that he would paint. Now we don't have that drawing. My hope is that it exists and that when this lecture ends, um, all of you at Rollins College will be scurrying around and looking in basements and, and um, uh, looking in dealer showrooms and trying to find a drawing of hands that's gonna have little pinpricks in it. And you'll know that's actually Leonardo da Vinci's original drawing uh, of one section of the Mona Lisa. We can see a few other things that he uh, originally was thinking of putting a little hairpin of some sort um, over here uh, on the side of, of her hair and uh, some char charcoal uh, drawings that he was using again for, for guides uh, for the veil of the Mona Lisa. So a lot of drawing actually went in to the painting of the Mona Lisa. Moving along to some other techniques, you have here one of the most extraordinary drawings of the, uh, of the Renaissance. It's actually 210 pieces of paper that have been uh, glued together to make this huge uh, cartoon. Again, cartoon being the full-scale preparatory drawing. There on the upper left, what you have is a view of scale, which is really nice. And you have the actual painting that uh, resulted uh, above and a better, slightly better view of the cartoon below. And we see here that Raphael too was using both that pouncing technique as well as the tracing technique, but also drawing grids in order to measure um, his drawing uh, for a more exact transfer as a painting. This was a pretty common technique. And here you have an example by Pontormo where we fortunately have both the preparatory drawing that still exists on the left as well as the resulting painting on the right. And they're not in the same scale, but it's so exact that you can do this mashup, which I'm not the first to do, by the way, um, uh, and it matches up almost exactly. And the idea of these squares is relatively straightforward. So these two examples are from your show, and um, I don't know if the resulting paintings still exist, but it would be nice to match them up if they do. And uh, assuming your paper is going to be on a slightly smaller scale than your, than your painting, um, all you have to do is have some sort of a ratio between your drawn square and then the, the, the square that's going to go over your painting. To make it really simple, if you imagine that each of these squares represents one inch and each of the squares that's going to be on the resulting uh, painting is say one foot, all you have to do is make sure that whatever is in uh, any one of these one by one inch squares takes up the same relative amount of space in the one by one foot painting. So that's a kind of simple way of, of looking at it. I've not had the chance to look at these firsthand, but I find these uh, really fascinating. The one on the left uh, using uh, uh, different types of inks, maybe even watercolors, in order to make uh, what's essentially a sort of painted drawing, if you will. Um, and then the one on the right, uh, which is um, even more fascinating to me because when I, when I look at it, I, I suspect that what happened was this, that, that if you start from the right, you can count that there are one, two, three, four, five, six even squares. And, and then it's been measured out to add a seventh square on the left, but it's actually um, cutting off a little piece. And, and, and I sort of have invented this scenario, but, but it makes sense if you go along with me, that, that the painter has, has made the drawing and has planned to grid it out, and it's going to be um, seven units long, whatever those units are, whether they're feet, whether they're inches, meters, bracha, whatever they're, they're, they're using. And, and in the transfer then to the panel or the canvas or, or the wall, you know, let's just use a wall as an example. Um, the, the painters are, are measuring it out and they say, uh-oh, we didn't account for this beam that's taking up a little bit of space at that seventh square. So we have to draw the last grid line you know, at six and three quarters or six and seven eighths. Um, and it, it puts back this sort of human element into the 
use of the drawings and in the making of art. It's, it's, it's a really fascinating occurrence that, that you don't have that last square on the left uh, being what appears to me uh, an actual square. It's more of a rectangle. But I also uh, saw another drawing in, in your show that made me think of another category of drawings, which would include these. Uh, drawings that were made not to become paintings, but meant to be works of art, works of art in and of themselves. Uh, some of these drawings, especially these that I'm showing you by Michelangelo, are among the most beautiful works of art, regardless of medium, that you will find in the Renaissance. And I particularly like uh, these. They were not meant to be translated into painting. They uh, are masterpieces in and of themselves, meant to be gifts. And um, this drawing struck me as, as something maybe not exactly the same, but, but kind of similar, in that maybe it wasn't supposed to become a painting, but was an interesting study in and of itself of a figure that's turned in, a, in an interesting way and that has the hair bundled uh, in a fascinating way. In, in a later century, you might call this sort of thing a trony if you're studying Rembrandt. Uh, uh, but, but, but here, it, it might just be a drawing that's done more for interest, more for self-study, uh, more for uh, the appreciation of, of skill uh, than anything else. All right, so uh, I'm I'm rushing along a little bit because I um, want to make sure not to not to go over too much. But but that was kind of part one of of my discussion, and and now we we will uh, lead into part two, and that is how to make a Renaissance drawing. I asked Professor Heller that, uh, uh, you know, in preparation for my visit to Rollins, if she could grow some some flax for me and raise some geese, that would be really wonderful. And and I think COVID put an end to that that idea. Um, but but they're going to factor into this uh, discussion in, in interesting ways. I also want to give credit where it's due. There's a wonderful book for new students who are studying the, these drawings by Alan Donathorne. And I've put some page numbers uh, in my PowerPoint slide so you can refer to the book for, for certain images. It's a wonderful analysis of, of the technique uh, of um, Leonardo da Vinci's uh, drawings. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. So you're gonna make a Renaissance drawing, what do you need? Well, really you need something to draw on and something that leaves a mark. It's, it's not that complicated. Uh, but there are many different surfaces that one can draw upon. Uh, I am assuming that in the show, al almost everything would be on paper. Uh, paper was a bit less expensive than drawing on, on parchment or vellum or basically animal skins, depending on which animal it comes from, a sheep or a cow. You know, you'd, you'd call it slightly different things, but, but basically skins. Uh, would be more, much more expensive than than paper, and you you can you can draw on other things as well. But we're going to to concentrate on on paper, and there are also many things that will leave a mark, and I'm just going to focus on the most common um, uh, uh, mark making materials. So paper is part of the picture. It's something that we often take for granted, especially today when things are so standardized. But an artist, any artist during the time, but especially we see this with artists like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, um, they were intensely interested in the materials that they used. And in fact, these two artists really appreciated high quality materials. And paper wasn't just paper. Uh, you might be using something to make a mark that needed the paper to be a little bit rougher. They, they, they talk in, in period language about paper having teeth, right? Um, that, that, that you wanted to grab something that you are um, uh, that you are uh, uh, braiding over the the surface. Sometimes you might want the the paper to be more smooth. Sometimes you might want it to be thicker. Uh, sometimes you might want it to absorb the material that you're that you're working with. And, and this is something to to keep in mind, and something that that I find over and over and over again when I talk with my artist colleagues. That, that our historians often overlook the differences among different pens, among different inks, among different papers. Um, but uh, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, basically you name the famous Renaissance artists, they were hyper aware of the type of material and the quality of the material that they were using. We'll start with paper. Um, where does paper come from? <laughs> well, they didn't have Office Depot back then. Um, and most of the paper came from 
uh, this plant that you're looking at here, really beautiful, which I've tried to grow in my backyard to, to varying success. Um, but it uh, was grown all the way into the, the modern age um, uh, in order to make paper, but also to make linen. So when we when we talk about true linen fabric, it's from this plant here that, that's called the flax plant. And again, to give credit where credit is due, uh, the papermaking industry really has its roots in, in the East and um, many, many debts to the uh, Muslim world uh, where the use of this flax plant uh, was uh, incorporated into um, other, um, other materials, especially mulberry bark and uh, Baghdad had become a, a major center during the, the Middle Ages for, for paper uh, production. Um, when this process comes into Europe, um, they start adding um, uh, discarded materials. You know, we, we live in a society today where we throw away so many things that can be reused. Um, and uh, your old clothing uh, in the 15th, 16th century was definitely going to be reused for something. You would never just throw it away. And one of the places where rags ended up was in the uh, paper paper industry. And you can see by the 13th century, by the end of the 13th century, you had a, a mill that was up and running in Bologna. And uh, by the time of Leonardo da Vinci, let, let, let's say you had many, many mills uh, that would have been supplying different papers uh, for him, especially coming from the north. And Leonardo spent a lot of time in Milan, so it would have been very easy for him to get different types of very high quality paper. Um, I, I give an entire lecture on the paper making technique. We're just gonna cut it really, really short here with this wonderful image from the 17th century. And what you see in the back right is basically a gear that, that you can liken to a, a music box, right? Something spins around and it, and it plucks uh, something that's going to make a sound. And in this case, what it's plucking is a little bar that's basically going to hammer down on, um, on some uh, linen fibers and, and maybe on some cotton fibers. And, and you know, it'd be the equivalent today of putting something in a blender and just, just mashing it, mashing it down and um, in water, of course, and then sending that to the vat that you see in the, in the front. And what's going to happen then is that one of these workers is going to take a, a screen uh, which has that wooden frame around it and basically pick up that, that uh, mash, which is going to level itself as he, as he shakes it on that screen and let some of the water drip out before turning it over, as you see in the, in the foreground. And usually they're putting little sheets of wool in between those pieces of paper, which, which helps in the, in the drying process. And eventually they're going to, to take those when they're partially dry dip that in a little gelatin, diluted gelatin, which is going to act as a glue to keep everything together, and then hang it to dry and you're basically good to go. Um, now paper wasn't cheap, but it was much less expensive than drawing on, on animal skins. And um, uh, here you have a wonderful example of a fairly high quality uh, paper. Uh, this is used by Leonardo da Vinci and you'll notice that there are the uh, uh, vertical lines that are going through the paper. If you look at them really carefully, what you'll notice is that in the very, very center of each of those lines, there's a, there's a lighter portion where, where you probably had a, a slightly thicker piece of metal wire that was keeping that, that screen intact. And, and what happens then is you get some of these, these fibers that, that congregate a, a bit more in those in those portions, and it and it leads to this streaking effect. Uh, oftentimes, it's not readily visible when you look at the paper, but if you look at it in different types of light, um, it will uh, show through very um, very well. And here's a nice example uh, where you have the drawing on the left being looked at straight on, and on the right they're shining light through the back, and that is helping you to see that. Um, that appearance then of what would be called the, the mold that they used in order to make, uh, make the paper. So again, uh, humanizing this whole, this whole experience. What you see on the left is a, a wool fiber that probably came from someone's pulped up old coat. And um, 
it probably was in one of those woolen sheets that they used to separate those drying pieces of paper and a, and a fiber uh, became embedded into the paper pulp itself. It's a, it's a fascinating thing. It's not necessarily undesirable either because it adds both a color and texture to the, to the paper. So oftentimes um, a, a dye could be added in order to make the painting, make the paper blue or, or pink, uh, or these extraneous materials would, would add nuance to the paper, which artists often found very desirable. And what you see on the right in that really interesting uh, design in, in white um, is a watermark. And even today when you're um, making your, your documents in Word, you can add a watermark, which, which ultimately comes from this technique of, of personalizing these, these um, papers by, by, by the different mills. And it would be the equivalent of just taking a paper clip and, and making a, a design out of it and dropping it in. Uh, the mixture uh, in, in when it's when it's uh, been been pulled up from the from the vat, and then that piece of metal is going to leave this impression that you see here. You can often find these watermarks in um, uh, in older in older paper. Sorry for that. So, um, one thing that we often don't like to think about is is artists uh, getting help. Right? We like to think of Leonardo just starting to draw, Michelangelo starting to draw, looking at something and drawing, but, but no, uh, they had help. They had aids, they had instruments, they measured, <laughs> they had compasses, they had scissors, they had straight edges, they had right angles, they had rulers, and all the various things that you would use today. And here we have a collection of those drawing uh, tools from the 16th century. Even more interesting to me is on the upper left here, those are Michelangelo's tools. He owned those. He used those. His hand was all over these things. He was measuring. Um, he was counting. He was using compasses. And on the right, you see evidence Leonardo da Vinci was too. We'll see more evidence in just a moment. There he is drawing some of the tools that no doubt he was using. And using his drawing as a way of better understanding uh, those tools. This drawing doesn't look like much, but it's actually really fascinating. So again, you can make up the story a little bit, but, but it's essentially going to be true. That what he did was he took one of those compasses like we just saw. And if I can get my cursor here, he put one end here and the other end he put here and basically dragged it in a circle and then dragged it in another concentric circle to make these indentations into the page. Then what he did was he, he set his marking instrument, excuse me, set one of these marking instruments like the one that you see Michelangelo would have used. And he measured out very, very evenly a, a, a dot at each of these points where the ends of that, that gear design was, was going to go. And he probably freehanded some of these Right, all he had to do is make a fairly even V, um, but he knew where he was going to land. And then in the center here, what he's done is he's measured out one, two, three, four. And down here, he's giving you that scale, measuring it out. You can see that's probably one of his A's and that's probably a backwards B and that's probably a backwards F. You can probably see though, that you can get into the mind of Leonardo through the drawing. Uh, through this, this manual labor that he's going through uh, in order to uh, create these wonderful uh, ideas, these wonderful uh, inventions. What you have here is a nice example where um, uh, they've been able to uh, essentially photograph the, the drawing and and then digitally remove the ink. And what's nice is that you're left with the impression that the uh, marking instrument left in the paper itself. It, it, it's kind of a drawing under a drawing, if you will. Again, something the artist never thought that you would see. Um, in fact, as of a few years ago, we never thought that we would see it either. Uh, but here clearly you can see 
um, some of those marks. And what's really nice about the marks is you can also see where um, maybe their mind was changed a little bit, or or maybe um, they were more confident in, in certain strokes. You can you can tell a lot about technique by looking at the way that the instrument um, uh, collided with the with the paper, and that's always again it's something that I that I say to my students all the time. You know, think of the human element here: somebody picking up a pen, picking up a piece of paper, making those marks, and being intentional about that mark making. All right, so what are they using to make these marks? Well, um, they were finding geese. Uh, and what you have are these feathers uh, that were being used in order to make quill pens. And, you know, one wing is only going to, to yield a, a couple of feathers on, on either side that would be suitable for uh, for the use of pens. Um, again, nothing went to waste in the Renaissance. They would use um, all the other parts of, of, of the goose for other, other purposes. But we're interested in, um, in, in, in the mark making. And you can see here these two Renaissance paintings where the artists are, are showing us uh, these, these scribes, these saints uh, at work using uh, just such pens and here you can see as well on the right, uh, an inkwell that, that's holding the ink that's going to be drawn up into that quill. And as the quill goes across the paper, it's going to be leaving that, uh, that ink. All right, so what types of, of inks are they using? There, there's three main types. Um, <clears throat> first of all, um, we'll, we'll go through carbon. Um, it's basically soot, and uh, it's still used today. It's a it's a it's a good pigment. It's a good ink, and we we make um, we make this in the in the in the chemistry studio actually when we do certain experiments with with uh, um, uh, these older techniques. But basically, you just burn something. Uh, you can burn bone. You can you can burn wood. You can burn various uh, things, and and that's going to give you a nice a nice carbon. That, that you can then use as, as an ink. Um, bister, as, as you see below it, um, was usually scraped from, from chimneys um, where you had uh, uh, wood that had been, been burnt over, over months and months, if not years and years, giving you this, this nice dense material to work with. Uh, but there, there's one that was prized above all, and that was what's called iron gall ink. Um, this is unusual, uh, and apparently it goes like this. Uh, oak trees are uh, uh, favorites uh, for wasps, and the uh, wasp causes what's in effect a, a um, reaction in the tree, a kind of defense mechanism reaction, which causes the tree to make these, these protuberances, which, which are called galls or oak galls. And without the wasp, they, they wouldn't be making these, but with the wasp, which causes in, in, in effect a sort of infection, uh, these, these galls are, are formed. And the quality of the ink from this is really wonderful. So what you do, again, we've done this in, in the chemistry studio, you, you simply crush that oak gall, um, you boil it in water to make this, this gallic acid, um, you add a few substances, including gum arabic, which would have been, been imported um, uh, from the from the east. It turns out Leonardo also uh, used his saliva um, as part of the mixture, and uh, the result is this ink that has these wonderful optical uh, qualities, which apparently turns more brown over time. And so many of the brown drawings that we look at by Leonardo da Vinci actually would have been um, a little bit darker like this drawing by Rembrandt that you have here. Now, I don't know if these two drawings from your show use iron gall, but, but it's quite possible. They, they look like the types of, of drawings that would have come from, from that substance. So it's something to, to look at, something to investigate. It would have been you know, one of the more tried and true techniques. But ink is just one of the things that you can use 
to use a mark on a paper. Um, you can use chalk and you can use charcoal. So here uh, you have an example of a, um, a chalk mine in Poland that apparently was used for, for centuries and which stretches for nine miles. They were basically cutting the chalk out of the rock and there was a very good network of, of trade uh, to get these distributed. And there you can see Leonardo da Vinci uh, using chalk for one of these uh, drawings. You get very, very beautiful effects. So um, whereas the um, oak gall is, is going to give you those, those really precise and um, uh, vibrant uh, browns, uh, here you can have, as you see in the detail, um, much more potential for, for shadow. And, and shade and for subtlety. Um, you can make harsher marks, you can make lighter marks. So there are these gradations of mark making that, that's really beautiful and that suited Leonardo in particular as he's trying to uh, show expressions of his, of his characters. And from your show, here's a, a really beautiful example that uses different colors of chalks. As you know, chalks come in, in, in many different uh, colors, but reds and, and blacks and browns were, were quite popular and, and of the most common types uh, that you would have found. Charcoal um, is another um, substance that was widely used, but, but it tends to be less durable. It doesn't, doesn't stick very well to the, the paper. But remember, if you want it to stick a little bit better, you might use a slightly more abrasive pa paper, something that's not quite as smooth, and get those, those particles to, to stick to a little bit more, more readily. It wasn't just as simple a process as burning something, although you, you, you could make it um, that, that way. But, but instead, what they would do is they would uh, put the wood in a, in a jar and then heat that in, to, a, to a very high temperature uh, and through an oxidation reduction reaction, what you get are these, these sticks then of, of charcoal, which you can still get today made, made in almost the same uh, way um, that gave them these really fine uh, charcoal sticks to use. And here you have um, Leonardo da Vinci uh, using both what's probably iron gall, uh, but then to get some of these, these nuances is using the charcoal. And originally this, this uh, drawing would have looked much, much different. It would have been much more black and the charcoal would have been much more vivid. And um, uh, you can uh, use your imagination to, to, to sort of recreate or maybe digital enhancement uh, to, to recreate what that drawing would have looked like. It's, 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 a, pretty, um, it's a pretty amazing thing even in, in its deteriorated uh, condition. All right. Um, I just have a few additional secrets to share with you, and I think I will make it well within my uh, allotted time. Uh, so, so here we go. Um, I just love this drawing. Again, you know, you have a story that, that seems pretty evident. There's Leonardo da Vinci all over the sheet of paper showing you his remarkable ability to draw figures and to draw machines and to invent and to be spontaneous. It, it's really incredible. But then you have this angel in the middle, which compared to the rest of it is actually kind of weak, kind of inept. And if you look at a detail, what you see is that almost certainly a student had started in it's probably a, a, a chalk uh, to make that figure. And then Leonardo has gone over it with ink, right? And said, basically, no, 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 young grasshopper, this is how you do it. This is how you do the shading of an arm. Um, uh, this is how you get the modeling. And it's this wonderful example of a, of a dialogue going on within drawing from, from two different individuals, one a student most likely, and the other a great master uh, here on this same sheet. Another little secret, we do have several examples of uh, Leonardo's thumbprint on these, uh, or fingerprint, not just his thumb, uh, various fingerprints. Uh, same thing with Michelangelo. Uh, we have various fingerprints on uh, the, the Sistine Chapel ceiling and, and from other sources. And, and yes, since you're wondering, um, uh, the FBI and other agencies um, have those fingerprints on file, and, and it's one of many techniques that one can use in order to investigate um, whether a certain drawing might have been made by a certain artist. It's not an infallible technique, 
um, but it's one of many techniques that you can use. And you can also see here that um, it's been pricked and gone over with a, uh, with a line. And we think that most likely what happened is it's coming from this area over here. Leonardo could have used that to uh, gain symmetry. If he folds the sheet in half, then he can get that, that corresponding mark on the other side of the, of the page. Um, so using the same, th using the drawing both as a drawing, but also as a template, if you will, in order to get a matching side. And this is new. Here's a sheet that looks rather boring. And it is, it is, it is, when you look at it like this. Uh, apparently what, what he used was a uh, metal stylus with copper and and it's, it's faded over time, but through the magic of um, modern technology using ultraviolet light, um, we see this absolutely remarkable. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci doing studies of, of hands and as far as I know, it's only since 2019 that we can see these as, as such. Um, absolutely remarkable. Um, UV light is, is relatively safe and uh, um, make sure you have a professor with you as you take that light up to your drawings, but you might find some surprises that, that lurk in the drawings that you have uh, for, your, for your study uh, at, this, at this show. We're almost done. Um, a very, very recent article that came out at the end of 2020, studying the microbiome of Leonardo da Vinci's drawings. <laughs> there you have it, the bacteria and fungi that have collected on some of these drawings. It's, it's almost certain that none of these um, fungi would have, would have come from the hand of, of Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, these drawings are hundreds of years old and they've been through many different environments. But uh, there are clues that, that these um, microorganisms might be able to give us as to uh, condition, as to how we go about conserving these a little bit more efficiently, uh, maybe about where these drawings have been in the past and under what conditions in the past, uh, maybe who has handled them in, in the past. So, so there's a lot of information here that again, even just a dozen years ago, we weren't even thinking that, that we could glean from these drawings and um, um, many, many opportunities in, in the future for investigating uh, these drawings. So just a couple of more slides and then I'll end. Is this even a drawing? It, it's one of my favorite drawings or so-called drawings by Leonardo da Vinci. At, at certain times though, this category that we call a drawing breaks down. There are elements here where he's effectively been painting, painting with ink, painting with watercolors, painting with substances that they haven't even been able to determine what all these substances are. Using chalk, using charcoal, using whatever it is that he's been using here. This seems to me, to most scholars, to be much more than anything that you could classify as a simple drawing. And so it, it's a nice example of, of maybe confounding uh, the scholar a little bit, confounding the students a little bit. We really don't know what to make of this. Um, it's a study for, uh, for something that was going to be a painting, but, but maybe somewhere in Leonardo da Vinci's mind, this was also the independent work of art as well. And it's one of the most remarkable things you'll, you'll ever see. If you get to London, um, uh, please make sure to go and see this in the National Gallery. And you have a drawing in your exhibit that I think echoes what Leonardo is doing. It's attributed to Luca Cambiasso, and he would have been familiar with, with Leonardo da Vinci, um, that um, unit of figures uh, seems to me like he's working through similar processes. So, um, so you never know uh, with, with your drawings um, what kind of stories it's going to tell you about one artist looking at another artist, uh, about artists experimenting with techniques, looking at papers, looking at inks. The final thought that I want to uh, give you is this. 
you know, the, the question often comes up, you know, what's it worth? What's it worth? Um, and drawings are often not considered to be in the same category of, of paintings, et cetera. Well, you know, on one level, you can say, well, what's it worth? Whatever somebody is willing to, to bid on it at auction or, or, you know, you often need two people to bid on it. So you get an underbidder. But um, uh, you have two examples here of beautiful, beautiful, high quality drawings by Raphael that each went for about $50 million. Right. So eh, that gives you one sense of worth. This drawing here, to me, is priceless. Um, it's mine, okay? I bought it on eBay for under 100 bucks. I don't have that much money to spend on drawing. So, you know, I have three of them, by the way. So, so this is one of my drawings. And I just love it because what it does is suggest to me this, this journey of investigation. And I haven't really gone down that that journey yet because part of me doesn't doesn't want it to end. It doesn't want it to be solved. I don't know who the artist is. I don't know the nationality. I have my suspicions about who might have done it and and, and where and in what time period. I bought it as Italian Renaissance. It, it probably is not. Um, but there are fascinating marks on here. Fascinating use of ink. Uh, fascinating paper. Uh, that has this wonderful texture to it. And you have the subject matter, Suzanne and the Elders, that also was is interesting subject matter and, and, and asks so many questions. So, you know, I wanted to end with this because one of the best things about your show is that these drawings have not been investigated like those Raphael drawings and like those Leonardo da Vinci drawings, that there's so much for you to do, so much for you to investigate. Um, I want you to be telling uh, these stories and um, being the detective, being the judge and, and guiding the rest of us on this uh, wonderful uh, path in looking at Renaissance drawings. So I'm going to end it there, and um, I'm happy to, to take questions. Um, here I am. Uh, thank you so much for this. This was, this was really fascinating, and, and I'm echoing a lot of comments that I see here in the, um, in the um, uh, stream. Uh, people really appreciate it. You're unveiling so much of those unusual things that I guess a lot of us don't think about when we look at drawings, um, the process, the functions, you know, there there have been a number of comments about how intriguing and, and fascinating some of these aspects that we don't think about normally. So I, I want to thank you for that. And there's some specific questions too. Um, one is coming from Hisela, our curator, and she's asking what role did drawings have in the artist's relationship with patrons in the Renaissance? Um, yeah, a, a very, a very wide ranging um, question. And, and uh, I, I fear I'd be a little bit too long winded if, if I really gave the question it, it, its due. Um, because we know that um, patrons wanted to see drawings. They wanted ideas of, of what the painter was going to do. Uh, we know that portrait paintings often started as drawings of the, of, of the patrons. Um, uh, so um, as we move further and further into the 15th century and then certainly well into the, the, the 16th century, drawings are probably playing a larger and larger role uh, between the, the patron and the artist. Um, in, in the earlier days, um, paper's expensive, a lot of drawings probably weren't kept, um, and um, things are a little bit are a little bit murkier. But um, just like today, uh, patrons, um, they want quality, they want to know what they're getting, they want to know what the art is doing, they want to know what they're paying for, and uh, with very, very few exceptions, artists generally were not able to just paint what they wanted, draw what they, whatever they wanted. Uh, they had to, to fit into a, a complicated nexus of, of a patron artist uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. So, so really, just for the sake of brevity, I'll, I'll, I think I'll, I'll end the, the answer 
there, but but um, uh, it was integral. Let's say it was integral to the, this relationship between between patron and and artist. Here's a more specific question from Doran. What was the most used or favored writing device and type of paper during the Renaissance? Well, well, quills, um, at least in, in Italy, would have would have been the the favored writing device, and and inks of a various sorts. But the the iron gall ink would have been a, a favorite, especially of of artists. Um, you know, I I am very very honest with my students when I don't know something, and and I say I don't know, and 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 one of my sort of infamous lines is that's something for you to do in graduate school, right? And then you can teach me. So, so you know, I've not done a comprehensive study of, of um, uh, inks that were used by scribes, by artists, et, et cetera. And so, so I wouldn't be the person to, to answer that one fully. And I, I'm sorry about that. But, but there, there are certain standard inks. Um, uh, Actually, when, when Professor Heller and I were graduate students in Florence, we'd both go to the archives and you'd look at these old documents. And, and um, in terms of the paper and the ink, there's, there's variety to be sure, but there's also remarkable consistency among these, these notaries um, with the types of inks that they're using. So, so they're kind of standard inks that they knew were durable, that they knew were good on these sorts of papers, that they knew they could write with fairly quickly, that, that would dry quickly. Um, and um, you're probably talking about, for most purposes, fairly limited ranges, um, although you have infinite ranges when artists get involved wanting to experiment with all kinds of different com combinations. So, so again, I, I think I'll, I'll leave that as a brief comment to just admit, I I'm not an expert on, on, the, on that, but the iron gall ink would have been one of the more common things that you, that you would have seen used in, in this context. I actually have a sort of related question to this or follow up. I was wondering if uh, the type of paper gives us any indication uh, of the type of drawing that a drawing may be, right? So if we don't know anything about it, can we tell, was there a sort of hierarchy and certain papers were used for a presentation drawing versus, you know, just a simple sketch or it, does that give us any clues? Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's one of those those cases where um, <laughs> we, we have in all of our documents at, at, at Rose the word normally, right, which, which is our wiggle word, right? So normally a student is supposed to do this, or normally a professor does this, normally class meets face-to-face, -face, right? But then you get exceptional circumstances right. And, right. and things kind of are busted apart. So, so normally I, I think that would be the case, especially when you're talking about artists who left us copious amounts of drawings where we can really see this. So someone like Mike, Michelangelo, he he was a real stickler for quality. Um, I, I had, well, we, we have a colleague who, who studies the clay that Michelangelo used for his models. Apparently that was the most expensive clay you could possibly procure, right? We know that Michelangelo took great pains to get the highest quality of marble right. that, that he could for his uh, sculptures um, when he had a choice. Um, and um, with his um, materials that he used on the Sistine ceiling, again, we know he's using really high quality. So for the most part, if, if Michelangelo is planning on giving a drawing to someone, he's using a pretty good high quality paper and it's, and it's thick and, and today it remains in just pristine condition. Though every once in a while you find a drawing that's on thin paper and you get the feeling that he just kind of took what was available and maybe it was a spontaneous act. And I was, I was working on one such drawing where, where it, it fooled me because the paper wasn't great paper. And what had happened was, was something that, that the conservators call a, 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 an ink migration, um, where, where, where the drawing from one side of the paper started to show through on the other side of the paper, right? So it looked like there was two drawings on, on the same side, but it, but it really wasn't. But but that happened because the paper wasn't great paper. But but the, you know, right next to it in the bin in, in, in the study collection at Windsor is, is, you know, a related drawing that's on fabulous paper. 
Um, so, so normally, yes, a, an artist who knows that this is going to be a presentation drawing to a patron or um, I'm doing a portrait of someone, you can see the higher quality of, of, of paper. But, but then you get these moments where, where no, things, things almost seem irrational. They, they almost seem to be um, leftover uh, bits and, and pieces. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a very interesting and different question <laughs> from Stan. Did the use of dangerous chemicals in Renaissance pigments cause any health problems with artists that we know of? And did that influence their art? Oh yeah, absolutely, <laughs> right? I mean, I, I remember when they, they exhumed um, Giotto's bones from uh, Florence Cathedral and they, they wanted you know, some way to prove that, that they were his bones. And they found out that, that the bones had this really high arsenic content in them. And um, um, you, you'd expect that from some of the pigments that, that the artists were, were using. And, and, and just a, a few years ago, um, there was a um, boy. There, there was a set of, of teeth, I believe it was, that they found in a monastic community in Germany. You can Google this, and you'll you'll find better in information here. But but the idea was that you know somebody was licking a, a brush repeatedly in order to to build up mm -hmm. um, a certain content of, of a chemical, which which was not doing her any favors. Um, but it but it was able to to prove the existence of these female. Um, artists uh, during this this period, um, um, red. I, I believe certain reds also have some some caustic um, materials, and and um, there are certainly some materials that that when a few years ago we were teaching a, a course using the ancient pigments, basically we weren't allowed to use uh, because they just would have been too dangerous for for our students to use. So you can still get these materials and you can still use them. <laughs> not at Rhodes in the classroom, um, but um, uh, absolutely the artists were using caustic materials. Now, to, to, to the effect that it affected their art, that's a kind of interesting question. You know, were, were the materials making them, um, you know, were the fumes making them dizzy or, or was it, were they having some other effect? I, I absolutely don't know, but but it wouldn't surprise me. You, you, you have things that you don't think of, like like when Monet um, started getting cataracts, the color of his pictures start to change. Yeah. And, 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 you know, so, so clearly these, these physical conditions are, are having some effect on the, uh, on the artists. Um, so, so I would think, I would think so. Um, and here's another question from, uh, actually from Professor Dennis, who taught this class. <laughs> Um, uh, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Can you tell us more about how you teach about drawing through collaborations with your colleagues in chemistry at Rhodes? Right. So um, I've always had a, an interest in in science, um, and um, oh, when I when I began as an undergraduate, I was pre med, like half the the freshman class, and so I took plenty of courses and. In chemistry and, and biology and physics, etc., um, and really through through conversations with some of my colleagues at, at lunch about Renaissance materials and, and techniques, I uh, worked up a couple of collaborations. One with a chemist who is no longer at Rhodes, and and we did a class where um, we tried to recreate uh, egg tempera painting using only original. Uh, type materials, which we did. And um, he then um, taught the lab sections where we investigated the materials and, and I taught the art historical sections and we both um, helped the students make make really bad egg tempera paintings, but, but they were using the original techniques and there was great utility to it. And um, he he went off to other adventures, but but now I have a, a another chemist who I'm working with and we have a, a course called the, the um, I think now it's just called Art and Chemistry, um, but we investigate different techniques of painting, sculpture, and, and drawings where um, I try to identify what, what they were using and, and how, and then uh, she um, tries to get those uh, materials and with the students in the lab, try to recreate them. And, and so uh, we've had pretty good success actually with, with some of these these um, older materials. If you follow the formulas, they work. 
Um, so, you know, Chinino Chinini leaves you this, this wonderful book of formulas and uh, it's been translated and, and there's um, uh, good additions that, that help you through the process. Um, um, it's fun and you make mistakes and, and you learn. And, and um, again, it's all part of this wonderful process of realizing that these artists were human beings. And, you know, some assistant was sitting there grinding pigment, which is a real pain. And, and without the help of a, of a modern grinder, you know, you, you just try it by hand for a little while and you realize, yeah, this is why you, you hire, you know, a 13 year old boy to do the grinding all day, all day long. Um, or, or this is why you hire a gilder who is more skilled at, at putting the gold down because when I do it, it, it flies up into the atmosphere and, and won't stick, right? And so, so you learn to problem solve and, and, and to close off air vents temporarily so that, so that there's no wind movement when you're using gold or to have proper adequate ventilation when you're using some substance that, that might um, uh, be a little bit dangerous. So, so it, it's, it's part of the process. I'm happy to share anything and everything that we've done in the um, course of, of that. I'd love to see more people teaching about techniques and, and um, uh, it, it's a lot of fun. It's one of those things where I learn as much, if not more than my students, just by going through the whole process. I think that's always the wonder of teaching, isn't it? Um, I, I think we could probably sit here all night and continue to talk, but um, I am mindful of everybody's time. And I, I do want to thank you so very much. And I echo a lot of other comments for your, not only for your knowledge and, and expertise, but also the enthusiasm that you bring to the to the subject. And, and um, obviously you love to teach. And um, that's something that I personally always appreciate and just amazing. So, and thank you for kind of taking the mystery out of some of this because I think I agree with you. Process is fascinating and we don't give it enough time. And it's always the behind the scenes and the secrets, you know, the mystery of a person. I'd love to see that Michelangelo actually needed to use, right, the help and he couldn't just, you know, hand draw all those amazing things. So thank you for that. And I hope you will come back to Rollins, hopefully in person. <laughs> and, um, hopefully when those drawings are still on view that would be wonderful to I, luckily them. they live in our community so i'm sure that mr micah who's very generous will let us come to his house if they're not on view at the museum so thank well, you very thank much. you really for your All students it's such a valuable experience to get to work with art objects that aren't over investigated and, exactly. and where they can bring true new insights into those uh, works of art and thank you everybody who joined us tonight. It was wonderful to have you. Thank you for your comments and questions and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye.